Doc Talk is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Hey folks, welcome to Doc Talk. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to have a pretty interesting show. I've got Mark Spare here from the Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine to talk about anaplasmosis and ticks. You're not going to want to miss this. You can start itching and scratching thinking about those ticks right now. So we'll see you here after these messages. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life. It's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do, every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Closed captioning brought to you by Vet Gun with Amel and new AMA Abamectin Vet Caps, the one two punch against horn fly resistance from AgriLabs. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Well, folks, welcome to Doc Talk. Mark? Thanks for having me here, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> it's great to have you, folks. This is Mark Spare, future to be Dr. Dr. Spare. Um, Mark is a unique talent here at Kansas State University or, or anywhere. He's working on his DVM and working on his PhD at the same time. Um, just a tremendous wealth of resource for us here at the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. Many years experience in cow herds, not only in Kansas, but in Russia. And, and uh, to have someone of your stature come back, join us in the profession, it's just great. Uh, Mark has been doing research and is can still doing research on anaplasmosis. And so let's just kind of kick it off uh, to, with this Ashland, Kansas native um, to talk a little bit about what is anaplasmosis. You know, Dr. Thompson, there's uh, this anaplasmosis is an obligate intracellular bacteria that parasitizes red blood cells in cattle. Um, it's caused by a bacteria called anaplasma marginale, and it's named for the, the residence it takes up in the marginal part of the red blood cell in an animal. Uh, it's, it's transmitted by blood, blood uh, that's exchanged between a mechanical vector or a biological vector. Mechanical vectors include such things as um, flies, those can be stable flies or house flies or horse flies, uh, needles, needle pokes, tattoo guns, ear, implant guns, ear taggers, biological vectors, by that I mean ticks. Ticks can um, actually, when they take up residence on an animal, they suck blood, it goes down into their midgut, then they exchange saliva and blood while they're feeding. So ticks can actually take in anaplasma marginale, amplify it in their midgut, and then they actually regurgitate it <laughs> as they exchange blood with an animal. I knew I didn't like ticks. <laughs> yeah. Now I just have another reason but uh, it's, it's amazing to me. So it's going, once it's in the blood, it, it kills the red blood cells and, and it is transmitted. I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize that they can transmit it with a tattoo gun or, or no. you know, and, and, and our own equipment. It's really, it's really odd the way um, we, can, we can propagate this disease. And I'll, I'll correct you a little bit. When the anaplasma latches onto the red blood cell, it does not kill the red blood cell. So what we find is the body, as those red blood cells are filtered through the defensive spleen mechanism, 
those red blood cells are, are destroyed by the body's own defenses. So we see these clinical signs associated with anemia, jaundice, uh, lethargy. We see dehydration leading to aggression of these animals because their, their own bodies are destroying their red blood cells. Okay, um, The thing that we use to kind of rule out this, this type of red blood cell destruction is that we don't find them urinating red urine because those red blood cells are being destroyed by the body so it's leading to this icterus. So it's kind of a rule out that we can actually use. Oh my gosh. So folks, if you hadn't figured it out, Dr. Spare has quite the uh, knowledge here in anaplasmosis and is going to do come back and we're going to talk about some more about what the clinical signs are of your cows if they have anaplasmosis, what to look for in your herd. And then we're going to talk a little bit about his research. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. More after these messages. Hey folks, Dr. Dan here. Thanks for joining us for our Cattle First Minute as sponsored by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica. And you know, today's Cattle First is talking about how to run a squeeze chute. And a lot of times when we run a squeeze chute, it's raise the tailgate, drop the tailgate on the head of the one behind, um, let the calf run through and ricochet off the front of the chute. And, and there are just some things that we can do to decrease injuries in the chute as a cattle. Make sure that we use the sides effectively to catch. If you have a hydraulic chute that we use the sides. Make sure that we have the hydraulics not set too high, okay? We want it to be at that 650 to 800 PSI on, on the hydraulics. But being careful that we don't miscatch a calf by its temples and not adjust it, or if you catch one by the hips and you're out there with the tagging gun in one hand and the syringe in the other doing the cha-cha trying to get it vaccinated, it's best to just turn that calf loose so neither you nor the calf get hurt. If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix Colostrum Supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. When you're in the cattle business, no matter how much it's a business, it still starts with cattle. It's this basic notion that sits at the core of how we approach things at Beringer Engelheim. We understand when you put the cattle first, it just naturally leads to doing the right things. If you want to do well in this business, you start by doing right. Take care of the cattle, and they'll take care of you. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. This segment brought to you by the new hired hand portable cow sprayer. For more information, visit cowsprayer.com. Folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here with Mark Spare. We're at Kansas State University in the College of Veterinary Medicine, where Mark is not only a veterinary student, but also working on his PhD, focusing on the topic of anaplasmosis. And just a great description of what anaplasmosis is, how cows get it, and what's going on in the body. Um, I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to the Keith Westerfeld, uh, who has supplied us with the new Doc Talk coffee mugs, these Orca mugs. Uh, thank you, Keith, out at Blueville Nursery. We appreciate the, the gifts. Um, when, when we're talking about anaplasmosis, Mark, what, what do the clinical sign, what's a cow going to look like that's suffering from anaplasmosis? That's a great question, Dr. Thompson, and, and there's still quite a bit of variability in the way each animal expresses their infection with anaplasmosis. What we see is that animals younger than two years old are affected differently, and that's a little bit of an arbitrary line, but affected differently than animals that are older than two years old. An animal that's younger than two years old is consistently making their red blood cells um, hematopoiesis, that's a vet school term that I've picked up here in class, <laughs> so I'm paying attention to that. Good, good. <laughs> uh, but, um, so, so they don't get the signs as much. The older cows is where we see the signs, such as, as icterus, which is the yellowing of mucous membranes or paling of that 
as they lose red blood cells, we see lethargy, they're tired, they, they're dehydrated, they don't go to water, they're often not with the herd, their heads are hanging down, they're not breathing like, a, like we would expect to see a, a respiratory case, but they are uh, breathing harder um, because they're, they're having trouble getting oxygen to their tissues as they're, as they're losing oxygen carrying capacity. Um, we also see some aggression which as I get thirsty and tired, I get aggressive too sometimes. So, so we see some aggression. So be careful when you're out there, you think you have an anaplasmosis issue and you see an animal by herself, she might come and take you. So, so be careful as you approach that situation. Um, so it makes sense, you know, just like when we see with some of those chronic BRD cases, calves that are hypoxic or having a hard time getting air, they're, they can't fight, uh, they can't run from you. So they decide to just get on the fight. That's and right. those anaplasmosis animals are probably having some issues with, with oxygen exchange and, and they Definitely. just get, get on the fight. Definitely. Yeah, so, so we've got these cows, they're out there that are, that are ictric. They're, they, you mentioned that they won't have the redness uh, or the red tint blood in their urine. And so that's one way we can differentiate between anaplasmosis yeah. and others. What, what are some of the recommendations today? Obviously, we want people to work with their local veterinarian, but what are some of the recommendations today for treatment of anaplasmosis? Good. Well, first of all, I think anaplasmosis, to, to be succinct, is, is a good disease to prevent. And so we need to prevent by, by having good husbandry practices, maybe changing needles every animal. That's a, that's a difficult one to do, but we need to. We can actually treat with um, oxytetracycline and LA-200, but by the time we recognize anaplasmosis, that animal had been infected for 21 days. So what we really see is an endpoint parasitemia where those red blood cells have already dropped, and that's what's really hurting the animal. So we see mortality maybe in 30 to 50% of cases of anaplasmosis, but again, it's really hard to, to really identify those cases in the field. Outstanding. Folks, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Mark a little bit about the research that he's doing on anaplasmosis. You're watching Doc Talk. Thanks for joining us. When looking at the number of farm and ranch operations, the USDA Census of Agriculture says cattle and beef production is the largest single segment of American agriculture. The census also says the average age of the American cattle farmer or rancher is in the late 50s. In order to support the continuous supply of U.S. beef, these producers need to do some business planning to successfully transfer their cattle operations to younger, independent producers. Uh, I'm Joe Mushrush with Mushrush Red Angus, and... Uh, my ancestors have been in this part of the world. Well, they walked in after the Civil War from Virginia. My dad was the start of Mushrush Red Angus. When we come back from college, we had about 100 cows. Was working mainly part-time. My wife Connie and I, once we took over, tried to expand rapidly, making it into a full-time uh, operation. We have told our kids that any of them that wish to return to the ranch, why we would do our level best to uh, make a spot for them and so far our oldest son Daniel is now back full time with us and some of the others have expressed a desire to return and so we have dedicated most of what we do into creating a spot and making a viable entity for the, anybody that wants to come back. In, in an effort to get more of our family back on the business we've started our own meat company and so when we can take say a flat iron or a petite tender and our local packing house has the knowledge and the ability to turn that into a higher retail cut we'll sell those retail cuts quicker and we'll sell them for three to four times the price of what we would sell them without some of those cuts being available to us the beef checkoff allows us to do something that we can't do on our own. We do not have the, the time or resources or the knowledge to go out and approach consumers on our own. By pooling our resources with other producers, it allows us to reach those consumers that we otherwise would not have any way to reach. And by combining our resources and our voice, why hopefully we can make a difference. And I hope one day that my children will be here on the ranch. And so we need to be able to be responsive to the demands of future generations that we may not even be aware of. And the checkoff helps our industry do that. It's easy to spot the man who uses Synanthic. With lower volume and less waste, Synanthic steps up your deworming routine. Get more deworming with less dewormer at Synanthic.com.
When it comes to stopping horn flies, cattlemen love their vet gun. Today they love it even more because vet gun now has a one-two punch with two vet cap insecticides. New AIM A abamectin can be used in rotation with AIM L for effective in-season control. Each delivers a unique mode of action to manage horn fly resistance. So start your in-season rotation program with AIM L and new AIM A abamectin vet caps from AgriLabs. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council. Improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with the 2B Dr. Spare. You'll be the second generation veterinarian, his dad Randall who I'm sure is watching the show, is, is veterinarian down in Ashland, Kansas. Um, Mark, you had some fun, well, at least it sounded like <laughs> fun, um, this summer uh, doing some tick capture work. Can you just talk a little bit about what you were doing? Yeah, that was uh, <clears throat> quite the experience, Dr. Thompson, and, and fun. Some days were pretty fun, um, but I did end up picking a lot of ticks off myself. Uh, so that was uh, certainly the sacrifice. Um, we also ended up with ticks in our freezer, but I'll come to that. And my wife wasn't real happy <laughs> a, about that thing. But so, so what we know about ticks and their interaction with anaplasmosis is that some ticks are able to be infected by this anaplasma marginale. Uh, some of these ticks can be persistently infected, similar to cattle, so they carry that through their lifetime. Now, ticks, ticks are an interesting species, and I'll quickly outline their life cycle. Some of them are one-host ticks, some are three-host ticks. A one-host tick sticks with an animal for their entire lifetime. A three-host tick actually feeds on an animal as a larva, drops off, molts to a nymph, feeds on an animal, drops off, molts to an adult, and then feeds on an animal. If they're female, they'll, be, they'll undergo reproduction at that point. They'll fall off as they're fed to fat. So if you see a fat tick, yeah. it's a female. Don't spread that around yeah, to too many humans. <laughs> so, so then they'll feed and then they'll lay eggs. Now a tick can lay anywhere from 3,000 to 7,500 eggs. And I, I found some of those nests. And when you find those nests, <clears throat> you, you really think that you stumbled into a nest, uh, just a pollen field. But after a while you look down and they've moved all across your body and then you get pretty nervous. So. Uh, what we know about ticks that, that actually interact with anaplasmosis in Kansas, we specifically have a, a, some dermacenter ticks. So this is the American dog tick, dermacenter variabilis. We are, we are confident that the males can be persistently infected with anaplasmosis, and they have to feed on an infected animal as a nymph. And then they'll drop off, of course, and they'll go back on as an adult, and then um, go ahead and feed. So they can get this disease as a nymph, as the middle life stage, amplify it for, any, I mean, weeks, months, drop off, and then transmit that how to several many, how animals. How many ticks did you go out and trap so, and find? Yeah, we did, we uh, trapped 5,013 ticks this <laughs> summer, excluding the ones that I mashed on myself. <laughs> what we did is we, we dragged the fields with, with flannel flags, and we drag them uh, and fairly systematically, and we went hunting these specifically these dermacenters to find ticks that were infected and then we'd flip them over, pull them off with, with uh, tweezers, put them in the freezer and we'll go back and study those for the molecular signs of, of being infected. So with you'll look and see which ones are infected and where they came from, what pastures and, and I assume yeah, we got to go to break here pretty quick but, but I assume you, you did this over multiple ranches and we did. We, we actually designed a, a series of, of sites where we could examine tick density, population distribution throughout the Flint Hills. So we studied pastures all the way from Pottawatomie and Riley County down to Cali and Chautauqua counties. I had a, a number of uh, young undergraduate girls who I'll give a shout out to. Uh, they performed uh, extremely well under some, I had them getting up at four o'clock in the morning and we'd got there before the dew to catch these ticks. So Well, if you're going to be a tick hunter and be spare to the tick pile you're gonna to have to get up pretty early anyway folks uh thanks for watching doc talk we're going to take a break and wrap up with some of dr spare's surveillance work after this
When it comes to stopping horn flies, cattlemen love their vet gun. Today they love it even more because vet gun now has a one-two punch with two vet cap insecticides. New AIM A abamectin can be used in rotation with AIM L for effective in-season control. Each delivers a unique mode of action to manage horn fly resistance. So start your in-season rotation program with AIM L and new AIM A abamectin vet caps from AgriLabs. Some call it a come from behind victory, an unlikely win, a reversal of fortune, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. This is our moment, our victory dance, because we choose confidence. We choose Zuprevo for BRD treatment. Ask your veterinarian to prescribe Zuprevo. Zuprevo is a fast acting, long lasting BRD treatment that you can count on to get the job done. Choose confidence. Choose Zuprevo for Merck Animal Health. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Mark Spare. We're at Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. We're talking about ticks, anaplasmosis, sick cows, summertime, but we're going to talk a little bit about a tremendous study that, that Mark's taken on on behalf of the beef industry, not just in the state of Kansas, even though it's centered in the state of Kansas, but one that's never really even been attempted mm. uh, to understand more about what's going on with anaplasmosis and its, its spread. Good. So one of the things that we don't know, or we, we don't know a lot of things about anaplasmosis. Historically, it's been a, a very significant disease throughout the southeast and in Kansas, even into the western Idaho, Montana area. We we're, are not confident, and it's very difficult to get a hold of the distribution and density of anaplasmosis infections. So in, we, in our cow herds. In our cow herds. Yep. Cow calf industry is, is inherently difficult to study because it's it's out there. It's yep. kind of nubious. So what we've done in Kansas is we've divided the state into nine districts, and we actually randomized veterinarians in each district that practice in a mixed animal setting, so they see cows and other animals potentially. Uh, and we, we randomized them and asked them, as we picked them, to if they would join us, partner with us in collecting samples from cows as they preg checked them <clears throat> or, or saw cow herds between October and January, although we're going to extend this into February of this year. So what we, what we believe that we will get a look at, a snapshot of, is a random sampling of cow herds throughout the state of Kansas in each of these nine districts. And, and as we submit these samples for assay, we anticipate that we will see positives and negatives by the herd, and, and we will get a good handle on a randomization, a random sample uh, of density and distribution of anaplasmosis infection throughout the state. So how many herds total? Yeah, we aimed for 16,100 samples, so that's 1,610 herds throughout the state. The and state has about 23,000 cow herds. And how many veterinarians would that involve then? To get we that? actually, I, I did uh, anticipate this question, so I did a quick count. We have well over 150 veterinarians throughout about 85 practices that are helping us in this study. It's a, it's, it's a big effort. Tremendous, a lot of tremendous relational opportunity. So then you also sent a survey out, <laughs> and, and can you kind of just... In a, in a nutshell, what, what you're looking for with the survey of the herds? Good, and it was a, it was a, we did send a paper survey out so that we would have management data on each of these herds as we look at their positive or negative status so that we anticipate being able to examine ratios or, or risks between management practices and the positive or negative status of a herd. Okay, so great study, lots of things going on. You got multiple herds, over 150 veterinarians, and you'll have surveys that would be able to say in the positive herds versus the negative herds, these are different management practices. That's exactly right. All right. Well, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you, sir. Outstanding job, and what a, what a talent and, and great person for the veterinary profession. We're very, very proud to have uh, Mark Sparrow here at Kansas State University. We're thankful that you watch Doc Talk, and if you want to know more about what we do, you can find us on the web at www.doctalktv. Remember, always work with your local veterinarian. Thanks for watching us today on Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson, and I'll see you down the road.
Closed captioning brought to you by Vet Gun with Amel and new AMA Abamectin Vet Caps, the one two punch against horn fly resistance from AgriLabs. For more information about this program or previous programs, go to DocTalkTV.com. Doc Talk was brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals.